This week's Come Follow Me reading has a great storyline to it, but people jump back and forth in several locations, so let's do a little bit of historical context to help us understand the content that we'll be reading today. We're in Mosiah's, Mosiah chapters 7 through 10, so if you'll turn there, in Mosiah chapter 7. Now, we previously, when we did the Words of Mormon section, we had this wonderful chart up on the screen that showed where everyone goes from Lehi all the way down to where we're at in the story today. If you want to go back and watch that YouTube video, it's the Words of Mormon uh, section. We covered all of this. What we're going to focus on today is everything in that bottom left corner. So we'll just jump straight to there. Now, in our story, there's a group of people that we learned about that leave the land of Zarahemla. Now, if you recall, Mosiah, the first Mosiah, took all of the Nephites that would follow him, gathered them all up. They left the land of Nephi, where they had lived since the day of Nephi, hundreds of years previously, to escape the Lamanites. There was warfare. Benjamin talked about the warfare throughout his whole life. It's only the end of Benjamin's life that there's that time of peace when he bestows the kingdom upon his son, Mosiah, who he named after his father, where they had the big tower built and that great King Benjamin's discourse we read about in the first three chapters, the first six chapters of uh, Mosiah. But there's a group of people that want to go back. They remember the land. So they want to go back to the land of Nephi. The original group that goes back, we call the ill-fated party because they never make it all the way there. There's fighting. They see what happens in the land. They don't establish the land. And there's just a horrible situation there. So they all go return. And then there's one, Zenith, who says, you know what? I really want to go back. So he wants to go back, and he does. This one's a successful trip this time. But they're there for quite a while. Now, you and I know the story as we've read the book of Mosiah that Zenith uh, turns, when he dies, his son Noah takes over. And we know that Noah is, a, Noah is a horrible king. And next week when we do the reading, we learn about wicked king Noah and his horrible reign as a king. We've already read about how righteous uh, King Benjamin was in the land of Zarahemla. So it's interesting. These two contemporaries, Noah, wicked. Benjamin righteous. And Limhi follows Noah after Noah uh, has all those problems. In fact, let me show you another picture here. Remember, Noah's so wicked that the Lord sends prophets, as he always does, before he destroys a people. Abinadi, a righteous, a righteous prophet, ends up losing his life. Remember, he's the one that gets burnt, uh, burned at the stake. And after Abinadi leaves, uh, no, or excuse me, Alma, who's one of Noah's wicked priests, start to realize, you know what, there's some truth to what Abinadi said. Fills the spirit, and he ends up fleeing Noah's presence. And we know that eventually Noah gets killed. But today's story, we learn about a man by the name of Ammon. So if you'll go to Mosiah chapter 7, and you'll learn about Ammon as King Mosiah. Now this is... Uh, Mosiah chapter 7, verse 1. This is Mosiah Benjamin's son. Remember, he's the king. The book of Mosiah is named after Benjamin's son, not his father. That, that just helps clarify which Mosiah we're talking about here. He was desirous, this is verse 1, to know concerning the people who went up. So how long had this been? I'll show you in a few chapters here the time period that we're talking here. It's been a long time. But he is desirous to know what happened to those people. We had the ill-fated party that they know. Remember his grandfather and father's the one who knew about them. He knows about them, but doesn't know what happened to them. So if you go to verse 3, I just want you to notice a couple things. Again, just a reminder here that when it says that they went up, we always think geography up means north. It's the opposite in the Book of Mormon. Up has to do with physical geography. They walked up up but where we're learning at in the book of mormon that means they're going south because remember they fled north to escape the lamanites so they're going to now go south which just so happens to be uphill and the leader they get is ammon now here is a great little thing that you can spend time with on your individual scripture study study 
all prophets are types of Christ. They are symbols of Jesus Christ. Ammon is an excellent type of Jesus Christ. And you could have a little fun by reading these chapters about Ammon and see how is he like the Savior. Well, in this case, uh, you'll notice he is the one who's going to go save the people from bondage, just like the Savior. He came and saved us from our physical and spiritual bondage. He leads with 15 men. The Savior today calls 15 prophets and apostles to uh, lead and guide the church and to go with him. So there's some great things. You'll notice also on the wilderness, the 40 days of traveling, starving, uh, all kinds of things. So fasting, I mean, everything that the Savior did, you'll see Ammon do here. It's great. You'll notice in verse 6, Emma took three of his brethren to go a little bit further. Jesus, when he was in Gethsemane, he, he invited three of his apostles, Peter, James, and John, to go a little bit further in with him, to bear that burden with him. You'll notice in verse 7, he's taken, he's bound, uh, he's about to be executed. and But he stopped. Notice in verse 8, he's in pri prison two days. Remember, it's on the third day that Jesus was freed from the... Uh, prison, so to speak, of death. So there's some great types here. That's enough. You can study those and have some fun on your own with that. Well, verse 9, we hear this king. This is Limhi speaking. Behold, I am Limhi, the son of Noah, who was the son of Zenith, who came up out of the land of Zarahemla to inherit this land, which was the land of their fathers, who was made a king by the voice of the people. Now, Limhi is telling Ammon who he is. Now Ammon celebrates. He's like, this is great. And this whole rest of this chapter is just the Ammon-Limhi conversation, figuring out who each other is. So if you'll now go to chapter 8, you'll see here that King Limhi, this is verse 2, King Limhi caused the Ammon should stand up before the multitude and rehearsed all that had happened to uh, their brethren who had went. So in other words, Limhi wants all the people to know, you know what, we're not alone in this. The Lamanites are keeping us bondage, but there are other Nephites out there. And they're looking to Ammon as their savior, so to speak, their deliverer. And if you go to verse 3, what does... Uh, Ammon teach? Well, he rehearses the words of King Benjamin. That's verse 3. What a wonderful thing. This beautiful discourse that has been given to the Nephites, but was uh, kept separate from Limhi's people because of distance and probably iniquity as well, is now being delivered to them. It's a, that's a beautiful, uh, uh, a, a beautiful uh, gift the Savior gives them. But then Limhi tells Ammon of an account where there was a group of people sent out to go find the land of Zarahemla. And they came back and they couldn't find the land. But they did find, in verse 5, plates which contain a record of this people uh, that lived in the land north. Now, you and I know that this record are those 24 plates that becomes the book of Ether, uh, the Jaredite record. And in this case, we... Limhi wants Ammon to translate it, but Ammon says, I can't do it, but I know someone who can, a, a prophet, a seer. And we have that wonderful discourse in here of what a seer is. Uh, that's chapter 8, where he recounts that voyage and all of that. Well, can I just do one more side content note in, verse, in chapter 8? It's verse 20. There's an interesting word in here that I think you should look up. It's worth reading. It says in verse 20, Oh, how marvelous are the works of the Lord! How long doth he suffer with his people? Yea, how blind and impenetrable are the understandings of the children of men! For they will not seek wisdom, neither they desire that she should rule over them. It's interesting that they use the word she to describe wisdom. It's a feminine uh, attribute. Uh, they use that at least in the English. Now, if you check the two footnotes with she, they have cross-references that do the same thing. And I am not going to argue that wisdom should be feminine. There's no doubt about that one. Now, let's go to chapter 9. 
As we get to chapter 9, if you'll notice the beginning of it, right at the very top, it says the record of Zenith. Now, this comes straight from the gold plates that Joseph Smith translated. Those are Mormon's words. So Mormon says, The record of Zenith, an account of his people, from the time that they left the land of Zarahemla until they were, until the time that they were delivered out of the hands of the Lamanites. Then we, when I mean we, the Latter-day Church, has added the italicized parts, comprising chapters 9 through 22. Remember, the original Book of Mormon did not have chapters and verses. That was added years later by uh, Elder Pratt. Uh, chapter 9, uh, notice verse 1. I, Zenith, having been taught in all the language of the Nephites. I think it's interesting that he mentions that. So it makes it sound like he wasn't a Nephite, like he was one of the original inhabitants of Zarahemla. However, I don't think that's true because of the next part. And having had a knowledge of the land of Nephi, he knows the land, and he wants to go back. So I think he's a Nephite, and he's a part of that. Now, he was in that original ill-fated party. Notice it says in there, having been sent as a spy among the Lamanites, that I might spy out their forces, that our army might come upon them and destroy them. We now see the original intent of this ill-fated group. They want to destroy the Lamanites and take over the land. But notice verse 2, for right in the middle. I would that our ruler should make a treaty with them. But he, being an astute and a bloodthirsty man, commanded that I should be slain. Okay, we know instantly now why this ill-fated party was just that, ill-fated. It was all in the leadership. He not only wants to destroy the Lamanites, but he's willing to kill one of his own people because he disagrees with him and doesn't want to kill the Lamanites. This is a bad situation from the beginning. And notice it says that there was much bloodshed. But, and they go back. They return back to the land of Zarahemla. But notice verse 3. Here's an interesting phrase. He says, And yet I being overzealous to inherit the land of our fathers. I think it's here that you can have a really good discussion of what the word zealous means. If you have children, you can ask them to look it up in a dictionary. You know, one of those actual paper... Uh, back dictionaries, uh, hardbound. It's great. Uh, have them look up the word zealous. See what it means, and say, and ask the question: Are there things that we should be zealous in, like temple attendance, missionary work, family history, doing what's right, and so forth? And then ask: Is it possible to be overzealous? Is it possible to be too zealous in an aspect? For example. I love temple work. I could go to the temple all the time. We should be zealous about doing temple work. But what does overzealous look like? If I went to the temple every day and neglected my professional work or my wife or children, would temple work still be a good thing? Well, obviously temple work's good, but my overzealousness is too much and it's losing the spirit of what the Savior would have us do. For example, we should be zealous in our profession. But if it's so much to the point where we're neglecting family, then the Lord would say, too much. Missionary work. If we're zealous with missionary work, we're going out and we're inviting our friends to read the Book of Mormon, and to come to church and participate in the fullness of the gospel. It's exactly what our prophets have been asking us to do. But there's also overzealous, where you spend so much of your time and energy that you're abandoning other things that might be equally, uh, if not as important, more important, such as family and so forth. So I hope you have a nice little discussion about zealous and, and overzealous. Now, if let's continue back in our in our story here. So Zenith is now back in the land of Nephi. They contained at least two parts of the land. And if you'll go to verse 8, they say what they do. The first thing they do is they begin to repair the walls of the city. And the walls of the city of Lehi Nephi and the city of Shalom. So there's at least two cities that they're going to rebuild. And they build things, they grow, they plant. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 11. How long are they there? Verse 11 tells us they're there for a dozen years. 
Then King Laman, that's the name of the king of the Lamanites, he's not happy with the situation. The Nephites are amongst his people. They're growing. They're expanding. They're being very, very productive. He becomes uneasy. And his fear is at the end of verse 11 that they might wax so strong that they would cause problems for the Lamanites. And then we hear a little bit about the Lamanites in verse 12. They're not a perfect people. They're lazy. But notice there's a purpose in that whole situation from the 12 years previous. King Laman had a plan. What was it? This is middle of verse 12, chapter 9, verse 12. They were desirous to bring us into bondage, that they might glut themselves with the labors of our hands. It's like, yeah, you can come live in our land. And a dozen years later, when you're all fully established, we'll live off of your resources and economy. Uh, we could get really political right now where there are large groups of people who feel it's okay to take, and the word take in here is tax. Remember what eventually happens here? They get taxed. They start out with 20%, which they say is just ridiculous amount. And then it jumps to 50% after uh, Limhi's people. Um, are attacked and overcome by the Lamanites. But nonetheless, we'll just continue on here for a little bit here. Now, if you'll notice that this is when Ammon shows up, and there's the great little story. He gets into the town, and he's watering, and he does all that good stuff. And he meets up with uh, King Limhi in this case. So now they're in bondage, and they want to get out. Uh, this is a great chapter to discuss how God delivers us from our, our, our bondage, our trials, our afflictions. He doesn't do it immediately, and sometimes there's a, quite a bit of time, especially because of the consequence of sometimes our sin that puts us in that bondage. So, uh, love it. There's some fighting that takes place, a great battle. Thousands of Lamanites are killed, what, 3,043, and then 279. So if there's 279 Nephites of, of Limhi's group, or excuse me, Zenith's group that's uh, being killed, uh, this is a large population by this time. Now let's go to chapter 10 for a moment. In chapter 10, uh, verse 1, what does Zenith do? He absolutely wants to prepare his people for the next battle. So we're still all the way up here, if I can highlight this here for a moment. We're here up here in Zenith's group. Uh, he's been fighting the Lamanites. People have been killed, and he wants to protect his people. So how does he does it? We're going to prepare. Again, here's a great discussion you can have with families and children. Say, the adversary is attacking us. What can we do as a family to prepare? What weapons do we need to build up in our home to protect ourselves from the adversary of the the attacks of the adversary. Great discussion you can have with there. And you can have that multiple times throughout the word chapters too. But let's go to verse 3. We find out that he is in the land for another 22 years. So if you do that math of 12 and 22, that's 34 years that Zenith's in this land. And that's quite this that's quite a length of time. Verse 6, the Lamanite king, Laman dies, and his son takes over. And there are yet more battles in verse 10. So we're going to see some uh, some more ugly times in this period. And another interesting thing is, why are the Lamanites attacking them? They gave him the land. Well, it goes with what happens in verse 12. They're a wild and ferocious and bloodthirsty people. Believing in the traditions of their fathers. Well, what were the traditions of their fathers? Again, verse 12. They were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren. In other words, it's hundreds of years since Laman and Lemuel and Nephi. But they're still having this family feud. Why in the world would somebody be fighting over the same thing for hundreds of years? Well, we can take a look at that in a national sense. Uh, the Middle East. How long has the Middle East feud been going on? Thousands of years. They're still fighting over the same thing. Who has the rights to the land? Who is the chosen people? And it's still there. But you can ask yourself in our modern society, in today's world, 
Are you carrying a feud that maybe your parents had or your parents' parents? Or are you creating a feud that you're passing on to your children that you think is no big deal, but really it can be passed on and festered? Because children believe what their parents teach them. Uh, sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's bad. Sometimes that's the ugly, right? And we see that in here. Well, to conclude, let's end with what we're going to see happen next. Zenith is going to eventually uh, pass away and Noah takes over. Several of the next chapters, including the next one, chapter 11, next week, we'll see what Noah does and how a prophet comes and teaches Noah. We know that was Abinadi. And then we're going to see Limhi's people get delivered and Alma's people who escape from Noah out there. So we'll have two groups, Limhi's people and Alma's people, and both will eventually escape and return to live with Mosiah in the land of Zarahemla. So next week we will cover Mosiah 11 through 17. Uh, God bless you and enjoy your scripture study this week.